happy Friday, everyone. We are almost uh, exactly halfway through our time together in CS 111. I thought we would celebrate with some majestic mammals, but before that, uh, Yelena is here to talk about focus. All right, so I have, I have for you here the, uh, the hoary marmot, a, uh, a furry creature that lives in the mountains of the Northwest. And they're both kind of uh, regal looking and also kind of lazy looking. They just like lounge majestically. <clears throat> Seems to be one of their, their main modes. Um, and they'll, you'll also see them hanging out together, uh, seeing what's up. Uh, something about uh, these hoary marmots is they um, uh, hibernate in the winter. So they basically double their body weight in the spring and fall and then go um, kind of shut down in hibernation for, for the winter. And they do so in kind of, a, they build up a grass-lined den. So here's a, a marmot gathering grasses for its, its hibernation uh, hidey hole. And I just think they, they're just kind of majestic. Uh, in in their their furriness, and I had my own encounter with a marmot that I thought I would share um, in the in the Cascade Mountains in Washington. Uh, this was not not a not a marmot that was super concerned about about being around people. Um, all right, what are your questions on uh, uh, the lab do today? Um, uh, debugging loops, lists, anything that we've we've been looking at. All right, couple uh, announcements. Uh, as uh, hopefully you saw, <clears throat> sent out a, a midterm uh, feedback survey uh, via Moodle announcement uh, yesterday. Please uh, take some time to, to fill that out over the uh, the next few days. Really helpful for me to get that 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 feedback. Um, we do have midterm break on, on Monday, so there's no, no quiz for this week. Uh, quizzes will, will resume their, their normal schedule next Friday. Um, thought I would start today with seeing as we're, we're at this halfway point of sort of just a recap of uh, what, we've, what we've talked about so far uh, in this course. So... <clears throat> Started out talking about a, a notional machine, kind of how we were going to imagine the computer system with its different components and how they work together. So we had the computer's memory, the slots where it could uh, remember things, but that only remembered things while it had electricity. So we also had the persistent storage where files live, such that when you turn your computer on, the files are, are still there. And uh, a portion of our notional machine that did uh, did the heavy lifting was the CPU, the central processing unit uh, that could move data around uh, and do arithmetic. Uh, we then looked at how to tell the computer to do arithmetic, whether it was uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, integer division, modulo, exponent, it's all sorts of uh, kinds of uh, different arithmetic operations we could uh, have Python do for us and uh, saw how, how order of operations and how we might use the round uh, um, uh, function. And along with that, we talked about assignment and variables, how we could have the computer do, to do math, but in almost all cases, we needed to uh, have some sort of multi-step process that involved the computer remembering the results of previous math that we had done. And 
We accomplish that by telling uh, the computer to assign some piece of data, some number, some text, whatever it is, to a variable, meaning that we put it into a slot in memory and gave it a label and then could use that label to refer to whatever value we had put there. And we did that with a uh, single equal sign for our assignment operation. Also talked about there are some rules about uh, variable names. Can't start with a number, can't have spaces, uh, only numbers, letters, and underscores. And uh, good coding practice is to give variable names that in some way describe what it is that they're storing, makes it easier to understand what code is doing. We also saw In addition to using assignment to send data to slots in memory, we could also use print to send data somewhere else to the screen if we wanted to uh, be able to observe what was going on uh, inside the system. And then we spent a while talking about functions, this really uh, important idea in uh, most kinds of, of programming. And one of the key ideas there was that functions, and I wrote data, that is not the word I meant. Eraser quest. Functions separate the definition of some sequence of steps that we want to do and the actual execution of those steps where we would define a function once and then potentially call it many times in different places, each of those function calls saying, okay, go do the steps that we set up in our, in our definition. So functions were a way to separate these two things, should, turned out to be useful in all sorts of, of different ways. I mentioned that one of the important terms was a function call where we would provide inputs to the function, which in kind of computer science -y terms is often called pass arguments or pass parameters. Those are our kind of inputs. So print uh, takes some inputs in terms of what's going to be printed. Uh, looked at absolute value function that kind of takes an input of a number uh, that we want to get the absolute value of. And uh, this function call was the name of the function followed by parentheses and then inside those parentheses were where we were providing uh, those inputs. Also saw that uh, we use return as something that only shows up inside the definition of a function uh, which uh, did two, two things. It sends data to where the function was called. It sets the return value. It determines what value that, that function call is going to have. Um, and we've talked multiple times about how return ends the function. It kind of sends the execution of a program back to wherever the function was called. And so this call and return are how we're telling the system to take a particular pathway through the possible possible steps. Programs running along one line after another, we get to a function call that says, okay, go to uh, the definition, do the steps there. When we get to a return, that sends us back to wherever we called the function. And we have also talked about function scope. And how we're going to think about functions as their own little world. Variables that we use in there are either the inputs or variables that we have assigned for the first time inside that function. And 
uh, these two parts together formed my function manifesto. Function should only operate, should only do stuff with the provided inputs or new variables the function makes. And functions should always have a return, though we've seen that is not 100%. It's more a function should always have a return unless you have a specific reason why it wouldn't. For example, uh, a couple classes ago, we looked at a function that set every element of a list to zero. And so it changed the input that it was given. It operated on the input. But once it had done that, there wasn't necessarily anything that it needed to return. It had already changed uh, the, the, the list. And so sometimes you might have functions that, that wouldn't need a return, but it will be for some specific reason. So always good to kind of have your, your first thought be to have a function have a return. Uh, Questions on, on any of these any of these points so far? All right, let's continue with our, our recap. Same time we started talking about functions, we also started talking about conditionals, uh, this way of branching paths or telling the computer to do uh, different things based on some, uh, uh, some variables or some state of the world. Uh, and uh, this let us, for example, write a program that might sometimes print out text in red, but sometimes not, as a, uh, depending on kind of values that it, that it got as input. And uh, these were our if, elif, else, uh, and we talked about Boolean values, things that are true or false, as uh, what we would use with this if and, and elif, ifs uh, some, some Boolean, Boolean value. If that thing was, was true, we would do what was inside the if, otherwise uh, we would not. And to get these Boolean values, we looked at a number of Boolean operators, ways of saying, uh, are two things equal? Are they not equal? Greater than, less than, as well as ways to combine uh, two different uh, true false values with and or or and uh, I uh, this would be a good time to mention that I told uh, I, I told some of you uh, a lie back at the beginning of the course when I said uh, if you have multiple ands and ors it's just going to do left to right that's wrong it will do all the ands and then all the ors and uh, the name uh, uh, the kind of formal name for that is precedence. You can, uh, if we Google Python operator precedence, it's going to take us to um, uh, you might find a chart like this that tells you kind of the order in which Python will, will do things. It will do things inside parentheses first. Uh, if we're indexing, that will happen. Exponentiation, addition and subtraction happen after multiplication and division. And we can see that ands happen before ors is. And so and has higher precedence than or, so all ands would happen uh, before all ors. All right, we're almost almost caught up to, to the present uh, after conditionals. We talked about loops and iteration, a way to have some uh, sequence of, of steps that we want to repeat. Uh, and we talked about for loops, which were definite. There's a defined 
uh, sequence that we are looping through. And we just saw about this week about while loops are indefinite loops that just check some uh, Boolean condition and might continue and will continue looping until, until that condition is false. And finally, we've talked a lot about sequences. Um, examples would be lists, strings, which are these special sequences of characters that we put in quotes. Uh, talked about tuples as these kind of, of lists that we can't change after we make them. Uh, we've seen indexing, which we, we always do uh, using square brackets and some, some index. Whether it's lists, strings, or, or tuples we're dealing with, indexing always uh, uh, square brackets. And uh, we've seen the len function, which returns the length of a list. We've seen the range function, which returns a, a sequence of, of numbers. And uh, the topic for today is another thing we can do with sequences called slicing. <laughs> not, not that violent. I just, I just wanted to do that. Um, all right. So that's our sort of summary of uh, what we've talked about so far. We've, we've uh, learned quite a lot about uh, things we can, we can tell a computer to do. Uh, any, any questions on, on any of these points? Anything be helpful for me to, to say more about? Cool. You can have a bunch of <clears throat> ors in a line and you're just like, is this equal to that or this or this or all? Is it going to read those ors left to right, like saying like A is equal to B or C or D, when really I wanted it to say is A equal, equal to B or is C equal to B? Yeah, something like this, A equals equals B or C or... Yeah, but what if like C <coughs> equals equals D, I wanted it to have two, two separate conditions, A equals equals B or C equals equals D? Is it going to read that as I want it to, or like hmm. um, yes, the the and and or have lower precedence than all these other Boolean operators, so it means that we'll always do like equals equals or greater than or less than before we do any ands or ors. Hmm. Okay. So it will uh, it will do this and then this and then the or. Other questions. All right, so before we get to the exciting slicing, I have a warm-up question for you. Do yes. Here we go. All right, so this is uh, using all stuff that we've seen before, a function foo, uh, it takes in a, a list, has some sort of loop and, a, and uh, another list called result, and uh, take a moment to think about what this is going to print out when we run this code. All right, please discuss with your neighbors how you uh, thought about uh, what this function would do. All right, indeed will be C. We'll print, well, our list results going to have two, four, six in it. Uh, someone uh, explain how you knew the loop would give us just two, four, six. There. Um, so it has to do with the range that we set. 
Um, so it starts at index one, but because we start indexing at zero, that means we won't get the first value in the list. And then it stops at um, that, like the length of whichever like, list that we're using minus one. Um, but because we don't don't include the stop, that means that it cuts off the last number as well. Exactly. That will. We'll go, this is a loop over the indexes of our list. Whenever we see range, uh, uh, whenever we have uh, a loop that involves range and then our loop variable i used as an index in the loop, we're looping over the indexes, uh, in this case only some of the indexes of a list uh, rather than, than the elements. Uh, and, as, and as Gabby said, we don't include the stop so the length of our list is 5, minus 1 is 4, so we go up to but not including 4. So index is 1, 2, 3, which are our middle three elements. Any questions on this example? All right, so let's talk about... Slicing up our lists. So, this is something we can do with any kind of sequence, but I'll start with uh, thinking about a, a, a list. And The basic idea is that we're going to have an expression that involves a sequence and is going to return, going to give us back a new sequence that has only some of the elements of the original. This sum actually could include no elements at all or all of the elements of the original, but something between none or, or all. And this function foo here does something that meets this description, but with a whole kind of loop and appending to, to a list where we take in a list and we're giving back a new list that has some of the elements of the original. So the syntax for this in Python is that we have our sequence and then in square brackets, We have three numbers, three integers separated by colons. And these numbers are the start of the slice, the end of the slice, and the step of the slice. Does something with these three parts look familiar? Eric? Yeah, the range function has a very similar set of inputs, and we're going to operate on the same idea, that we're going to include the start, not include the end, and go by the step. Which, for example, means that if I had... A list one, two, three, and then I said uh, a one colon uh, uh, two colon one. This would say start at index one, stop at index two, and don't include it, and go by ones. So this would print out a list with just two. Index one, up two, but not including index two. Like our range function, we don't have to include all three parts. As we've seen, our range function used was just one thing, or 
uh, only two things. So if If we don't include each of these, uh, they'll be filled in with some default value, something that, that uh, it will do if we don't include it. So in range, if we don't include the step, what is, how many does it, does it step by? Yeah, I see a bunch of folks holding up one. That's right. So if we leave off our second colon and don't put in a step, so if we had done a 1 colon 2, that would have been exactly the same as 1 colon 2 colon 1. So we'll, we'll have a step of 1 if we don't fill it in. Uh, if we don't, if we use range with only one thing, it, that's, that's considered leaving out the start. And where do we, where, what does range start at if we do like range 10? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We will start at zero. So we'll start at the beginning of our, of our sequence so we don't include a start. And for end, unlike range where when we have just one thing, it, uh, it is considered the end, in this slicing, we can actually do all different combinations. So we can do a 1 colon 2 to leave out the step. We can do colon 2 colon 1 to leave out the start. We can do 1 colon colon 1 to leave out the end. We can do colon colon 1 to leave out both the start and the end and only include the step. Uh, we can do colon 2, which is just the end. So this is the end, and, and the step, start, step, and we have the version where it's just the step. And for each of these, you know, this 1 colon 2 was the same as step by 1. If we leave out the end, We might think of this as, uh, if we leave out the end, we go, the end is actually past the end of the list. And what I mean by that is that when we leave out the end, we will slice all the way through the end. In this example, index 2 is our last element here. But when I put index 2 at the end, we go up to but not including the end, and I don't include 3. When I leave out 2, that's when I would go all the way through the end, and this one would give us 2 comma 3. This one where we only include the step, and the start and the end are a default, 0, and past the end, that's going to give us the whole list, 1, 2, 3. How about this one, where we leave out the start, but our end is still 2, our, our step is 1. Cool? That's 1, 2. Exactly. That we default to starting at the beginning, go up to, but not including index 2. And this would have the leaving off the step here, default step of 1, so these two are the same. All right, what are your questions on slicing so far? What's not, what's not clear? What could I go over? Yeah, Brian. Uh, can we use negative numbers? Can we use negative numbers? Good question. 
Can we use negative numbers as list indexes? Yeah, we've seen that a negative index is kind of counting back from the end of the list. And we can do the same thing in our slices. So another way to write our go up to but not including the end. Start at index one, go up to but not including index negative one. So go up to but don't include one from the end. So we can use negative uh, as the end. We can use negative as the starting point. So this would start three from the end and go up to but not including one from the end. So this would give us one and two, uh, the list of one, two. We can even use a negative number as a step. So if I do a colon colon negative one, I'm saying default for the start, default for the end, the step is negative one, things get a little, so when we have a negative step size, everything flips. So this will give us a new list that's the reverse of the original. Because we, when it flips, our default start becomes the end, our default ending point becomes the beginning, and we go backwards through the list in our slice. So this will give us three, two, one. Other questions? Cool. Why is this like, so common that it wouldn't just be a sequence method and it's like its own playing with brackets? Um, can you say more about what you mean? Like, you know, we have other string methods like split or something, then why is this such an important thing that it's just its own? Like, it's not mm. a sequence method. So why, why do we do this with, um, why is this special and it gets to use these square brackets uh, and not some method? Um, so one part of that answer is uh, that we want to be able to do this with all kinds of sequences. We want to be able to do it with strings, with tuples, with lists, with other kinds of sequences. Uh, and when we have something that we want to work the same across all kinds of sequences, like normal indexing. It's convenient to have some sort of special syntax for that versus uh, a method that um, you would call with each. Uh, and the other, uh, the other reason is, is you got it in your in your question, um, is that it turns out in practice we want to do this kind of slicing a lot, uh, and so. Uh, the, the folks designing Python decided, look, this is really useful. In practice, programmers end up writing code like foo here that sort of does this slicing, but kind of manually with a loop and everything. So we're just going to make this really convenient in Python. There's no reason it had to get this like special convenience, but uh, they, they decided, and uh, as someone who's programmed in Python for a while, I, I have indeed like used this constantly. John. So if A was just like a string, like a word or something, it would just work the same way going through each other. Yeah, exactly. So for example, if uh, A was an excellent string, like birds, and we did A uh, 1 colon uh, 3, this would give us the string I R. And then we start at index one and go up to but not including index three, which is the letter T. Uh, and so this slicing will just apply to the elements of a sequence um, for any kind of sequence.
Other questions? All right, let's do a bit of practice. What slice does this function foo uh, uh, do for us of the, the four options there? All right, discuss with your, your neighbors why you chose the slice that you did. All right, we, we will indeed get slice D. Why, can someone explain why uh, y sliced. <laughs> um, so pretty much same thing with the range. It starts with one and then it goes to negative one, but instead of doing the length, it's just automatically the length. Exactly. That, uh, and, and Emma makes a, a great point about uh, how we give indexes for the end of the end of a list that the index negative one, our last <laughs> element, is the same as the element at the index of the length of the list minus one. Because our index is for a four element list, zero, one, two, three. So the last element is the length minus one. Two from the end going to be the same as the length minus two. So these negative indexes are another case of Python saying we're going to make it like slightly more convenient to index from the end of the list. So you don't have to bother, you don't have to, to know the, how long the list is in order to index from the end. Any questions on this? Cool. Um, can you still use like a string or another variable as you step in a split? So can you we use other things than um, than just plain numbers uh, as are uh, parts of a um, parts of a slice? Um, we we certainly can answer a there perfectly valid Python to have an expression like len of v as one of the things that's going to return a number. Um, so any variable or expression that gives us an integer, we can use as part of a slice, but only integers. So we can't use strings. We can't use anything else besides integers. Other questions? All right. For our last few minutes, I would like to, no, not, not in here, like to give you a little code writing challenge that I like to call Fruit Ninja. We have a list, apple, banana, blueberry, Cherry, and I would like you to figure out what slice of the list fruits will give us the last two elements. So if I write print fruits brackets, I want you to figure out what slice, what thing I would put inside these brackets to print out the last two elements. I also want one for the middle two, one for the first and third, and one that gives me the entire list of fruits in reverse order. They all should be a single slice that will give us these. So work with your neighbors on uh, uh, working through what these slices might be for our last few minutes. All right, we have 30 seconds left, so I just want to uh, show you what these will be. These are also in the notes. We want one way to get the last two is to start from two from the end, go all the way to the end. We want the middle two. That's pretty straightforward. We want to start with the second one, go up two, but not including uh, index three. First and third. 
we can say just count by twos. So start at the beginning, go to the end, but counting by twos, that will give us the first and third. And reversed, you can see up here, we can do that with a step of negative one. These are not the there, these are not the only way to write these slices. Uh, there are other ways as well. Um, but that will do it for uh, today. Uh, home, uh, lab four due tonight, uh, Monday uh, midterm break. So I will see you on Wednesday. Have a great weekend.